car crash cases, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts. The attorneys with Josh Wright from the law firm of Hollis Wright and host David Lamb. Good evening and welcome into the attorneys. Thank you so much for joining us on this Sunday evening. For the next half hour, we have a panel of experts assembled ready to deal with a topic that we believe is of interest to you. Uh, more on that in just a moment, uh, but a reminder of how you can join our conversation. You'll see at the bottom of the screen ways you can do so. You can get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Also, all throughout the program tonight, attorneys from Hollis Wright are standing by live. It's a, a free confidential, all fair conversation. Uh, maybe it has to do with what we're talking about tonight. Maybe it doesn't, but an opportunity to get some great free legal advice. So take advantage of that throughout the program tonight. Now leading our conversation, a partner there at the firm of Hollis Wright, Carter Clay. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you, David. Hope you're doing well. Doing well. Thank you. Yeah, tonight we're going to be talking about premises liability okay. and really what we're talking about are laws involving people that are injured on the property of another and what are their rights relative to being injured on somebody else's property. Right. And if they think that they have a legal claim involving those injuries, what do they need to do to be able to prove a claim? And that's really okay. what we're gonna be focused on here this evening. And this area can get a little bit complicated and I think we're gonna try and simplify it a little bit so that the viewers can really understand these concepts and really appreciate what it is that they would have to prove in the event that they're injured on the premises of another. Right. And, and we've got Michael Eldridge here with us tonight. And Michael is a new lawyer at our firm, but he's been uh, practicing law for several years now at, at some other firms in the area. And we're very fortunate and proud to have Michael at our law firm. He's doing a fantastic job so far with us. And I know it will continue into the future. And we wanted to get him on the show. This is his first time on the show to talk about premises liability laws and talk maybe about some clients uh, that we have right now that have been injured uh, based on conditions of other people's property. So Michael, welcome to the show. We're glad to have you. Well, I'm glad to be here, glad to be working with y'all. Um, like you said, I uh, uh, spent the first part of my career defending these cases, got a lot of experience uh, doing that. And when Carter and Josh called, it was impossible to say no. So now I'm uh, using that experience to take it and uh, represent victims uh, and personal injury and, and other matters. Well, tell us a little bit about your practice areas at our office, the other matters that you're working on from a personal injury standpoint. Well, Hollis Wright, as most people know, handles uh, uh, the gamut when it comes to personal injury, mass torts. Um, primarily, I've worked in auto, trucking, um, slip and fall cases, premises cases like this on both sides. Um, so I know how both sides think about it. Um, we've got dog bite cases, um, basically anywhere where someone is liable for another one's injuries and they're asserting a claim to um, for the medical damages and the injuries that they suffered. Well, I think it would be helpful because I've done shows on premises liability before and like I said earlier, it can get a little bit complicated. So the way I kind of approach these uh, types of cases is the first thing that I'm looking at when somebody gets injured on somebody else's property is how did the incident occur? And what I mean by that is, is am I correct in that when we talk about premises liability cases, we're talking about an injury that is the result of a condition associated with the property. Yeah, and like I said, it's not a simple thing, but if you're putting it simple, that's, you're exactly right. Uh, premises liability is going to be a situation where injury occurs because of some dangerous defect, hazard, condition on someone else's property. And under the law, property owners can be liable for those injuries if they fail to take reasonable steps to either uh, remedy that condition or to discover that condition. Um, and with the cases of businesses, especially if they did not uh, adequately warn about the condition that's on the property. Right. And the reason I wanted to mention that is b there are a lot of situations where people get injured on somebody else's property, but it's not evaluated in a premises liability context because it involves what we call active negligence. Let me give you an example, which would be if I'm over at your house and I'm in your driveway and your wife is driving her automobile out of the driveway and she runs over me and she didn't see me and I were to file a claim against Michael Eldridge or his wife for running over me, that's not a premises liability case even though it happened on your property. That's going to be viewed just as a simple negligence case just like an automobile accident. That's exactly correct. Okay. So a premises liability is like you said, it's going to be some kind of defect or condition on the property that is dangerous. 
So that's what you're looking for. So in the, the situation that you just talked about, that has nothing to do with the property. That was my wife's fault, uh, or it may be your fault for standing in the wrong place. Well, but could be some defenses there as well. That's, actually, that's <laughs> absolutely right. Um, but that, like you said, that would be active negligence. Premises liability is going to be some kind of defect right. or condition on the property that caused a danger or a hazard to someone that then caused their injury. Yeah. And the reason I think that's important, as we'll probably talk about in a little bit, but the reason that's important is if it's a premises liability case, it's evaluated one way and there are defenses available to the premises owner that would not be available to them if it's a case of active negligence. So sometimes in my practice, David, or our practice, we actually want to try and classify these cases as active negligence cases as opposed to premises liability cases because it takes away some of the defenses that the premises owner would have. Absolutely. So like you said, there's all types of defenses. Um, Notice, for example, if someone's backing down a driveway, even though you're on their premises, they don't have to have notice like you would of a dangerous condition, say, if there was water on the floor here tonight and someone didn't clean it up. Um, so there's all types of defenses, all types of elements that wouldn't be in your typical tractor trailer case or automobile case that you have to prove in order to find a property owner uh, liable for your injuries. All right. In the premises liability cases, the law has a classification system and they classify the injured person, as I understand it, in three ways. Talk about what three ways they get classified. Well, in terms of premises cases, status is everything. So the, the law breaks this, when we're on someone else's property, the law breaks us into three different categories. We're either invitees, we're licensees, or we're trespassers. And the property owner's duty to us is dependent upon what classification we fall into. So invitees, for example, that's going to be if you're on someone else's property for their financial benefit. So that's if I go to Publix, I'm buying my groceries. When I go onto their property, I'm an invitee because it's for their financial benefit. It's open to the public. Their duty to me as their invitee is to take reasonable steps to keep their property in a reasonably safe condition free of any hazards as opposed to a licensee, which I've always thought was semantically kind of a, a, a weird term to, to classify <laughs> this group of people, but a licensee wouldn't be like uh, the case at Publix. It would be if my wife and I, for example, were cooking dinner, I said, Carter, come on over and let's eat dinner. As soon as you step onto my property, because you're there with the express or implied consent to be on my property, you are a licensee. And my duty to you as a licensee is to warn or remedy warn you of or remedy any concealed dangers that I'm aware of. Um, and then there's trespassers, which we all usually think of in the criminal sense, um, where the duty is almost nothing. And we're gonna break those down further throughout the show, David. I know we're about to go to break, so we'll wait until we come back. Good deal. We'll, right. we'll pick up right there, right where they uh, uh, step aside just for a moment. We'll be back uh, as we head to break. A quick reminder, uh, an educational and an informational opportunity is how Hollis Wright looks at their social media accounts. You'll find them on Facebook if you search the term Hollis Wright. And on Twitter, it is uh, Hollis underscore Wright. Great uh, follow there, so be sure and keep up with them there. Stay tuned. We've got more of the attorneys is coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright, a personal injury law firm. Thank you for watching The Attorneys. Now we hope you, a friend, or a loved one never needs legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple. Provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free, so if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury related topics, you can call, email, or text us. Or you can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter, or simply contact us by going to hollis-right.com and click on the Contact Us link. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us watching The Attorneys. Welcome back into the attorneys. Appreciate you being with us tonight. Hey, a reminder uh, before we head back into this conversation with Carter and Michael, that attorneys from Hollis Wright standing by live even as we speak. 
um, to talk to you. The number you see there on your screen, take advantage of that opportunity. And as we return to the conversation here, Carter, you guys have been on the other end. You've answered some of those calls. Uh, they do kind of run the gamut, right? You don't have to just be talking about premises liability tonight, kind of anything you want to talk about. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Um, but what do we want to talk about the uh, invitees, licensees, and trespassers? And let's talk about some examples of cases that you see in your practice involving uh, invitees and the types of incidents involved there. Yeah, I think the one that most people are familiar with is what is, is called the slip and fall. That's where, like you said, you're at Publix and let's say they just mopped up the floor. Um, they have a duty to warn you that there's a, there's a dangerous condition, a wet floor that you could slip on. If they don't provide those adequate warnings and you're walking through, which we see all the time, someone's walking through, they slip on that slip floor and they injure themselves. In those situations where they fail to keep the premises in a reasonably safe condition, they could be liable for those injuries. So that's gonna be a situation of an invitee. Yeah, and we see a lot in our practice, we've handled cases and resolved cases involving uh, you've got sort of the fruit display in grocery stores. Mats are essential because you've got fruit that's dropping. People are stepping on it can create a wet area. We've had cases involving uh, grease on the floor at restaurants where grease from the kitchen is being tracked out in areas where the patrons are going to be walking. And we've had slip and falls involving that. So those are just some examples of the types of cases that we've handled. But what are some of the, what's the most common defense that premises owners use in those types of cases. And I, I'm sure we're on the same wavelength here in terms of what, what is it? Well, there's two. Okay. Uh, the first is notice. So okay. you, you mentioned that fruit stand. That's gonna be a fixture. That's something they put in. They made that fruit stand in unreasonable, uh, unreasonably dangerous condition. It hurts you. You don't have to prove notice. But the water on the floor, the grease on the floor, you have to be able to show that they should have discovered that they sh in, in their reasonable due diligence they should have discovered that water on the floor and cleaned it up notice is a is a tricky thing but then in turn and what they'll do on the flip side if you can't prove notice they'll say well if we should have known you should have known it was open and obvious yeah. so that's that's the second defense if they if you prove notice then they'll go to open and obvious and say you should have seen that grease on the floor you should have seen that water on the floor and you should have avoided it yeah and, and that's a great uh, point because the open and obvious danger is probably the most prevalent defense that we see in these types of cases and that's one way or one reason why sometimes you may try and get the case outside from being a premises liability case to one involving active negligence because the open and obvious defense is not a defense to an active negligence type case and let's jump in and talk about licensees for a minute so social guest uh, you invite me over to your house or I invite your family over to my house. What types of cases do you see from time to time involving homeowners inviting people over to their houses? Well, one um, that we see often, um, and it's a, it's a totally subset of laws, but it's still gonna fall under premises, is dog bites. Um, if I know I have a dangerous breed of dog or I've got a dog that's bit someone in the past, I invite you over. If I don't put that dog away, if I don't keep you away from it or warn you that, look, there's a dangerous dog here, um, that's a situation as a licensee, um, a, a social guest that's on, on my property, I have a duty to warn you of a concealed danger like a, a dangerous dog. Right, and we've seen situations as you probably have in our office and on the defense side involving uh, defective handrails, walking down steps, uh, uh, bricks that are loose, concretes that are, is loose, where people will step and they will fall, uh, unique aspects within the home that may cause a tripping or slipping type hazard. Those are some of the things that we see, correct? Absolutely. Um, stairs, like you said, handrails, um, anything that's a danger, that's a concealed danger that you not living in my house, not having knowledge of these dangers, but I should have knowledge. I either have to fix that handrail or make it where it's safer. I've got to warn you that this is a dangerous condition. And, and one of the things, David, that we tell uh, clients that call us, because invariably you're going to get the, I was over at my buddy's house, his property was defective, but I don't want to sue my buddy. I don't want to sue my friend. But the reality of it is, is that's why you have homeowner's insurance. The homeowner's insurance, and they're going to have liability coverage for these types of events where people are injured on their property. So you're really, even though technically you're making a claim against the homeowner, it's really not going to financially hurt them, or at least not very much, depending upon what maybe they have as a deductible. But you're really going after their homeowner's insurance coverage, and that would be the coverage that would pay you to compensate you for your injury. So certainly you should 
should always talk with an attorney about your options there and not get so caught up in the fact that you were hurt at a friend's house. Uh, we, um, mostly we're talking about private commercial property. A uh, uh, question here about governmental property. What if I'm injured on government property? Is there a special rule for those kinds of claims? Well, that's a fantastic question because often we we always get as lawyers we think about what's called the statute of limitations that in Alabama for example for a personal injury case like a premises case in this situation you have two years to file a lawsuit or you're barred forever with governments you have to put um, those government uh, agencies whether it be a county or municipality that you're bringing a claim against them usually within six months it varies but at, at a minimum six months is what you're going to uh, have to uh, put them on notice of, of a claim that you've got a premises case uh, or any claim for that matter against um, uh, any any part of the government. Yeah, the the idea of the premises liability in the law would apply the same as to a governmental entity. Generally speaking, there are exceptions as it would to a private landowner. But what Michael's talking about is you have notice requirements to a city like Birmingham if you're suing the city of Birmingham for some defective condition right. in the property that the Birmingham city owns, you've got six months to put them on notice of your claim. And if it's a county like Jefferson County, I believe you'd have up to a year to do that. Once you put them on notice, the two-year statute of limitations still applies, but if you had not put them on notice, then that can actually operate as a complete bar to uh, any recovery. Let's step aside right here, take our uh, second and final break of the evening. We'll come back uh, more with Carter and Michael whenever we do come back as we head to break. Another reminder about the attorneys standing by live right now to speak with you. Take advantage of that opportunity. Just a few minutes remaining in the show. Stay tuned. We've got more of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Drew McNutt with the law firm of Hollis Wright. We often get asked, what happens if someone is injured by a motorist who doesn't have any insurance coverage? In tonight's Legal 411, we will address uninsured motorist coverage. Under Alabama law, all automobile policies issued must provide uninsured motorist coverage unless the name insured rejects the coverage in writing. If you purchase this coverage and you are injured by an uninsured driver, you can make a claim against your own insurance company to compensate you for the injuries caused by an uninsured or underinsured driver. While liability insurance is required by state law, it is estimated that over 20% of the motorists in Alabama do not have any coverage at all. Uninsured motorist coverage provides you with the ability to protect yourself and your family in the event you are injured or killed by one of these uninsured drivers. If you are concerned about what, whether you're covered, I recommend that you check your declarations page or contact your insurance agent to discuss your coverage options. If you do not have uninsured motorist coverage, consider adding it. And if you do have it, discuss increasing your limits. Oftentimes, you can purchase hundreds of thousands in coverage for less than $100 a year. Please remember, your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on the real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. Thanks for watching the attorneys on WVTM 13. Welcome back in to the attorneys. This is our final segment, which means the uh, clock really is ticking now on your time to take advantage of the opportunity to speak with the attorneys who are standing by live or to join our conversation. So if uh, you got a question, we'd love to hear it. Carter? Yeah, we've talked about invitees going into various businesses for uh, the benefit of the, the property owner. We've talked about licensees, which we've kind of characterized as social guests. But let's talk a minute about trespassers because there are some important aspects to the trespassing laws in the context of premises liability. And I think most people out there would think, well, if somebody's trespassing on my property and they get hurt, there's no way that I could ever be held liable. But that's not always the case. As, as with everything in the law, there are exceptions to the general rule. It always depends. Yeah, talk a little bit about uh, trespassers in the context of this law and, and potential areas where people need to be careful. 
Okay, yeah, so when it, in, in terms of trespassers, the, the thing to think about, because we often think of trespassing in a criminal context, like I said, and that's, that's not the case. What it simply means is, is that you are on someone else's property without their implied or expressed permission. And that can be for a lot of different reasons. And the duty to someone generally is that the property owner um, is only liable for their injuries if it was caused by the property owner's wanton or willful conduct. And all that means is, is that you took actions that you knew were likely to result in someone's injury. So if you come on my property and I didn't invite you, you are a trespasser, but if I've booby trapped the entire property, that doesn't mean I'm off the hook right. because I took actions that I knew that if someone came on uh, to my property, they'd probably get hurt. And but you're doing something almost intentionally to maybe try and injure somebody. Which is exactly what the law is gonna say is wanton conduct. But in terms of exceptions, there are things that happen all the time. Children, for example, they wander onto people's properties and are they there without permission? Can they be classified as a trespasser? Sure, but there's all types of laws and ordinance. For example, if a child fell into someone's pool that wasn't kept reasonably safe, wasn't locked up, was just open for anyone to walk into, that could be uh, conduct that you could be held liable for, um, even though the child could be classified as a trespasser since the child wasn't expressly or impliedly uh, uh, invited onto the property. Right, and having done this for 20 years, we've seen cases where that exactly uh, has happened, where you've got a five or four year old uh, child perhaps, or somebody younger even, uh, that wanders onto somebody else's property. And I think they call that what the invited <laughs> nuisance type doctrine, right. where you've got a pool out there, it's gonna look inviting to a young child. Child gets in a fence, gets in the pool, and winds up drowning. And the claims are made against the homeowner because there are all kinds of ordinances and laws out there that require you to basically have a fence around a pool. And if you don't keep your fence locked or in a condition where a two or three year old child can't open it to get in, you could potentially be held liable. And, and Carter, that's exactly, it's situations like you just described, that's exactly why it's important to get an attorney involved because there are these exceptions. This is not completely black and white and the attorneys can go through it and figure out exactly how you classify and whether or not you have a case. That's why in, in circumstances just like you described, it is uh, vital to get attorney involved to evaluate that case. Got a question here. Let's say that I've been injured. What do I need to prove that I have a good claim? Well, I, I hate to go back to first year law student, but it's just like with any claim, you got to prove that someone owed you a duty, they breached that duty, and it caused you your injuries. So with the premises case, um, it's going to start with those classifications, but you've got to prove that the person that you're bringing a claim against actually owned the property and that they owed you a duty. Um, if that duty is to keep it in a reasonably safe condition, you've got to show that it was not in a reasonably safe condition, that they did not take the reasonable steps to keep it in a safe condition, and it was because of that, those actions or inactions that led to your injuries. And that's, that are, those are the elements that you're going to have to show in order to, to bring a claim. And, a claim. And, and to extend upon that just a little bit, in order to prove a claim, you got to have evidence. Okay. And this is one of the areas of law where it is so critically important and vital that to the extent that the person who is injured is able to do so, I mean, obviously you're gonna have those situations where the person breaks their arm really bad in, an, in a fall and they get taken away in an ambulance to the hospital. They're not gonna have time to be able to gather evidence at the scene. But if you're dealing with somebody who's hurt their back or hurt, hurt their neck, and it's not a situation where they've got to get to the emergency room immediately, we always would tell people, uh, gather evidence at the scene. You got your smartphone or your iPhone with you. Take pictures of the defective condition on the property. If you fell in something, if there was liquid uh, soap on the floor that was leaking from a bottle, take a photograph of that. Take a photograph of the bottle. Make sure that you report the incident to a manager or somebody in the store and make sure that they uh, write out an incident report uh, specifying what happened. If there is evidence, like for instance, we've had situations where people stepped on something uh, that was broken in a store and that caused the fall. Gather the broken piece of evidence there at the scene, either preserve it yourself or make sure that the store is going to preserve the evidence so that you will have it because all of that evidence is what Michael and I or any lawyer is going to use to be able to substantiate or prove your claim because once you leave that store if these things are not done everything is going to be called into question well maybe they didn't actually slip on that soap or maybe they didn't fall on that broken piece of glass or we did what we were supposed to do big area is slipping on freshly mopped areas did they have signs out 
Uh, sometimes they put the signs out, sometimes they don't. And if your claim is they didn't put them out, if you can capture that on a on a camera mm -hmm. at that moment, it really helps out. Uh, two minutes till our final thought, so about four minutes left in the program. But curious about um, the, the cost of such cases and kind of how the payment works. How expensive are these cases uh, for the clients? Well, at, at Hollis Wright, our, our clients never directly pay us. So we take it, these cases um, at our, our own expense up front. We pursue them, so our time, um, any expenses that comes out of our pockets, our time, we never go back and ask for, for anything uh, later, regardless of whether it's, it's fruitful or um, the, the claim fails, which we always hope never happens. Um, but sometimes you don't, you don't have a case. Um, uh, so it's not gonna cost anyone anything to pursue one of these claims. Now, if we do, um, uh, are successful and, and do collect damages for the injuries uh, against um, uh, whoever we're claiming them against, uh, we will take a fee out of that. Uh, but in terms of bringing the claim, it's at no cost to our clients. Yeah, everything that we handle in this area of the law is going to be on a contingency fee arrangement through some percentage uh, that we will assign to each uh, particular file. It'll be done by a written contract so everybody will know. And Michael's exactly right. If, we, if the case doesn't work out, if we turn the case down, or if we handle the case and unfortunately we lose the case, then they never have to pay us anything. We just eat the expenses that we have in the file and we don't get paid a fee for our time. But as part of the expenses, though, I do think it's worth mentioning that sometimes in these cases we do have to retain experts right. depending upon the defective condition that we're talking about in the property. Sometimes you have to hire uh, experts to assess and evaluate those conditions and give expert testimony to really nail down the claim and what you're trying to prove. So you have to keep that in mind because if you have to hire an expert, our expenses go up a good bit and therefore we have to be a little bit more conservative and selective perhaps in the cases that we handle. Uh, we only have two minutes remaining, so just about out of time. We want to give both of you the opportunity for a final thought. And Michael, if you would, you go first, please. I'm going to piggyback off something uh, Carter talked about in terms of making these claims and how to make them successful. I think uh, one of the most important things is, is not only staying organized and, and getting all the evidence, like Carter mentioned, time is of the essence, too. Cases get stale, um, and if you do not get an attorney involved or you don't bring a claim, uh, there's things like surveillance that's going to be lost, it's going to be purged, there's going to be evidence that, that they're not going to keep up with because you may bring a case later. The quicker you can get into a case, the more likely you're going to be able to build um, a, a case that you're going to be, able to be able to bring a claim that you can prove later. If you wait a year, six months, a year, you may lose it because of a, a statute um, and you may lose it because the, the, you, you weren't able to put your evidence together at, right when the incident happened. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Those are great tips. One of the things I'd want to mention is we talked a lot about the injured person and what they have to do, but I think it's important that we give the premises owner or businesses some ideas and tips on how they can protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is three things, uh, mats, uh, proper signage, and inspections. Uh, those are all very important because the vast majority of cases that we see against grocery stores or businesses involve slip and falls or trip and falls uh, and those types of things. If you've got mats out in areas where you know they're going to be wet, that will help. If you've got signage out showing the customers clear. that there's, they're going into a wet area mm -hmm. and if you're doing periodic inspections of those areas to yeah. clean up any spills, it's going to go a long way to help them out. Hey, gentlemen, appreciate the time. Great job. As always, thank you for joining us as well. We are so grateful that you join us each and every Sunday night. We'll be back next week. We look forward to seeing you then on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright.